Hey guys, it's George Uno here with REI Club with another edition of First and Worst, where I bring really experienced real estate investors on to tell us about their first deal and then tell us about their worst deal because we can all learn a lot from them, how they get started, how they get that first deal. Uh, if you're a newbie investor or if you've been doing deals, it's good to learn from their worst deals so you know what a really bad deal looks like and you can avoid the pitfalls and learn from their really expensive lessons. So my guest today is Mike Singletary of Skipforce. And he is running a giant data company that provides skip tracing data to real estate investors all across the country. So if you've been in the game a while, I'm sure you've heard of Skip Force. Uh, it's one of the top providers of skip tracing data. And he's also launching another venture now uh, called ISA Pros, which is training inside sales agents to do more prospecting, setting, and closing. Um, Mike's really a uh, serial entrepreneur, you could say. Uh, he's started multiple businesses. He's also an active real estate investor. He's done about 500 deals in the last five years, and he's holding on to enough doors to make some really good passive income right now. So, Mike, I heard you're down in Austin, Texas. How are you doing today, Mike? Yeah, Austin's fantastic, man. We moved here probably about eight years ago from Houston. So uh, I'm born and raised. Well, actually, not born and raised in Houston. I've been in Houston ever since I was probably a teenager, but um, but Austin's home now. Um you know, I started my real estate career in Houston, but only maybe for about a year. Uh, but, but I really kind of, um, you know, sharpened my axe here in Central Texas. Very cool. Uh, a lot of our guests are from down there. A lot of our listeners are from down there. And geez, so many people are moving there from all over the country. It's just got to be exploding down there, huh? It's crazy, man. I went to school here at UT back in the early 90s, and it was just a sleepy college town. And now uh, I, I don't even recognize it, but it's cool. I mean, you know, it's change, it's evolution, right? Uh, the locals here hate it, but I love it. Yeah, it's cool. It's gotta be a lot more vibrant, a lot more fun things to do, so that's cool. It's an awesome place to raise a family, man. So take us back there to Houston. What year was it? When were you getting started into real estate? And what uh, what kind of spurred you to give real estate a shot? Yeah, man, that's a, that's a crazy story. Uh, it was like 2014. And uh, at that time, I owned high-end hair salons in Houston. So you don't really hear that a lot, that type of transition, especially a bald guy, bald straight guy going <laughs> in that industry, right? But that was my jam back in the day. And I did that for like 20 years, right? And, um, and I, I loved every aspect of it as far as like I was very, it was creative. I got to, you know, work with beautiful women. I mean, I met my wife there, all that stuff, right? Uh, but the systems and process that we had in place, I mean, really, it was on autopilot. It required maybe 10, 15 hours a month out of me. And I was just getting bored. And of course, you know, uh, like everybody else, you've read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And you know that most people that's really generated real wealth in, in this country has been through real estate. And so I remember the first deal. Um, it was a complete cluster. I didn't, I had zero idea what I was doing. I, I don't care how much um, they try to force feed you, uh, you really, you really not, you're not going to learn until you really, you know, get in the trenches. And truthfully, I never really have been in a sales position before. So to sit there and to be in that kind of situation, not really knowing what I know, you know, not what I, not knowing what I was supposed to know or, or whatever. Um, I was unbelievably uncomfortable. I remember that I was very uncomfortable talking to the seller and, and we, they agreed on a price and I couldn't believe it <laughs> truthfully. Um, and I, I brought the, I brought the actual contract to my mentor at that time. And, uh, and I sold it for $1,000 and <laughs> now I laugh. I mean, because he took advantage of me truthfully, man, but I didn't know any better. And I knew he took advantage of me at that time. Truthfully, I knew he did. Cause I, I right afterwards, I had another opportunity uh, to sell it for more. And, you know, but once you, once I committed, then that, that was it. You know, I wanted to maintain obviously the relationship. Uh, and so I sold that for $1,000 on my very first deal. So that was a wholesale deal, right? For a thousand bucks. That was a wholesale deal. He, yeah. Well, I, you know, they told me that I should wholesale my first ten deals. I, I think I wholesale the first two or three, and then I'm like, okay, I'm going to go ahead and kind of dive into the flip stuff. That's funny. <laughs> that my first wholesale deal is the same way. My mentor, I sold it to him, took a thousand dollar assignment fee because I just kind of wanted to see how the process worked. And then yeah. looking back, I was like, oh, that was silly. 
It, it was. I mean, the, the sad part is I had an offer like very the very next day from a neighbor who I should have talked to in the beginning, right? And he, mm -hmm. they were going to offer me like ten thousand dollars. And at that time, like ten thousand dollars was such a, for you know such a quick transaction. I was like, oh my gosh, right? And um, and then of course I talked to my mentor about it. He's like, hey, listen, you know, we had a deal, and I'm like, you know what? You're right. We had a deal. So it yeah. is what it I mean, is. Yeah, yeah a 10x profit, but uh, you <laughs> stuck to your guns and you know, your relationship guy, and you, you held your word. That's pretty honorable. Uh, I mean, it, it, it is what I think for me uh, in my life, uh, most of the things that has happened for me was because of my relationships with other people. Right. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and I've been very fortunate as far as that's concerned. Yeah. Well, you know, your reputation is worth more than $9,000. So that's good to take away from that. <laughs> <laughs> for sure man <laughs> so okay just a couple of wholesale deals in you're like i want to start flipping what'd your first flip look like my first flip gosh that's another thing i, I had zero idea what i was doing so i should have wholesale that one but we flipped it uh and i was still in houston it was like my third deal at this time right i think i was right before i moved here to austin and uh, i had no idea anything about construction i had no idea how to manage uh, construction a process, you know what I mean? Timeline, scope of work, all that stuff. Everything's completely just winging it. I'm trying to read the manuals from, from the franchise and, and, uh, we've, well, I think we made money. I think we made about 15, $20,000 something like that, but I did it just so I could go through the process truthfully. Right. I was like, okay, I mean, why am I going to make a thousand or 2000? I mean, you know, obviously our ad spend was a lot higher than that. You know, why don't you, and I had, and I was very fortunate when I got into this business, I had some means, you know, so I didn't need to wholesale. Um, and so once I started that, I moved to Austin right afterwards and we were predominantly a fix and flip. Uh, and then we've kind of morphed into some other things like new construction, stuff like that, but we were predominantly a fix and flip company at the beginning, beginning years. So how'd that first flip go? Did you run into a lot of problems with, with managing the project? Did you go over budget or under budget? How did, how'd that uh, go? You know what? We went over budget. Um, you know, it was really a great learning experience on how to deal um, with contractors and making sure that um, they did what they are supposed to do and not getting too ahead of them. Um, so I was very fortunate in that, at that time that I had some business acumen to where I, I could tell if they were kind of, you know, not telling me the truth and I wanted to make sure that I was sticking to my guns, but, um, I was babysitting a little bit more than I ever would now. Right. I, I was having to really babysit it and really because I didn't really, I didn't know enough to set the clear expectations and understanding what a true scope of work would look like and all what the timelines are supposed to look like. So um you know it's the first one the first time you do anything it, it's going to be horrible and I, that's been my experience almost with everything like i suck at almost everything i start out at and i just i just fail forward as fast as i can yeah that first flip going from wholesaler to flipper has got to be you know get your get your boots wet and everything um, you, up, man. I mean, you know what I'm saying? It's like, you know, you, man, I'm like, I don't, I knew nothing. I mean, it's so funny when I look back on it, man. It's like, I knew nothing at that time. Uh, but you don't have to know everything, right? I mean, that's really the key, right? You, I mean, a lot of people have that analysis paralysis stuff and they don't do anything. And uh, I'm fortunate to be the exact opposite. I just kind of jump in and I'll just figure it out. How did that first flip turn out? Did you, you made, you said you made 15, yeah, yeah, 20 money. Yeah, it, it, okay. it was, it was good. I mean, uh, I didn't over rehab it. Like that's a typical story that you get, right? I didn't over rehab it. Um, it, the margins was really low for what it was, you know, but we, I think we made anywhere. I can't remember in that anymore, but between 15 to 20,000. And typically of course, now we'd like to have a much, um, I require a much higher margin on my flips, you know, mm -hmm. but that moment I'm like 20 Xing what my previous deal was. Right. So, and it didn't take very long, right. It probably took probably about three, four months. So it wasn't the, the money, the cycle of money wasn't too bad. Yeah, that's good. It's good turnover. And we can all learn from that. Don't over rehab your properties because that's how you yeah. get over budget, over schedule and really, really pinch yourself. Absolutely, man. I mean, we got to we got to realize that we're not the ones living there. Right. Uh, uh, OK, so that deal went well. I want to move to your worst deal. Like, tell us about a train wreck, dumpster fire, just horrible horror story. Uh, but take us along the path. How many deals did you do before then? 
uh, you guys were in Austin now. So kind of give us the journey. What led up? Yeah, to man, I think we're here? probably a couple hundred in by this time. Right. And at this time we were, um, you know, doing, you know, million dollar flips and new construction and stuff like that. And so this house, I got on the golf course, uh, by in Lakeway, it was, you know, it was a million dollar home and the flip was a complete gut job. So it was probably, I can't remember exactly the scope, but probably about 250,000, something like that on the re on the rehab budget. Right. And I was super excited about it because the payday I thought was going to be great. But I ran into GC problems, you know, and that's always been a problem of mine to a certain degree. I keep some for a certain period of time, but, uh, uh, you know, for an extended period of time, uh, I haven't really been able to crack that code. And I wasn't really willing to bring them in house. But this one, I should have known. I should have known because he was a little bit green. He was honest. It, I, I thought he was honest. He felt like he was really honest. And, and uh, but the problem is his partner wasn't honest, right? And so, mm -hmm. I, we completely gutted this huge house. It's probably about 5,000 square feet, completely gutted the whole thing. Uh, most of it at least. And, you know, changed walls and modernized everything and, and, and stuff like that. And we were running behind on, on time, big time because of permits. Cause if you're in Austin or Lakeway, more so in Austin, uh, the permit process is just an absolute nightmare. Um, and we're running over on time and then we started running, um, um, over budget quite a bit. And then also by the time it was supposed to be listed, I can't remember the year, I think it was, um, it, there was a dip, right? For, for whatever reason. So it stayed on market a, a little bit longer uh, than I needed. And so we had to start dropping price. And I remember we were looking at about $150,000 loss at that time. And so that was stressful. That was pretty stressful. Um, and then I remember my private money people was almost, I owed them 150,000. Right. And these are people I had relationships with. And, and, and so I remember, you know, going, Hey, I could just ask them, Hey, listen, I can get your money back, but I can't pay you the interest. But then that just ruins my credibility. And I, I didn't want to do that. So what we did is that we sold it. I gave them all their money and it was a great lesson for me because I've raised millions just from this single deal alone where I lost 150. Uh, they would have been fine with it, give their money back. They would have said yes, because they were great people. But the fact that I kept my word, they told all their friends, their families and stuff like that about me because they knew I was losing money. You know what I mean? They knew they, they, I keep, I keep, I keep, uh, them up to date on what's going on and stuff like that. Um, and so that was just a really valuable lesson on, on relationships, uh, because, because it felt it hurt at that time to lose that amount. Um, the residual, what I gained from it was, you know, exponentially more. Yeah, that's super important. I mean, again, you stuck to your guns, kept your word, kept your integrity, uh, even though it cost you money, a lot more this time. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, we're seeing the same thing, right? We see a dip here. So guys, if you're in that situation, learn from Mike, don't, don't think about the short term and, and, you know, what you can avoid on this deal. And if you can kind of stiff your lender a little be a be a person of integrity because uh, as mike said you know i paid him back tenfold right yeah at least i mean i could call them now and if i need a couple hundred three hundred that whatever it doesn't matter they don't even look at the properties anymore right i don't even i give them a prospectus but they don't even look at it they just wire it you know because we built that type that level of trust between you know that that was one person at that time now i had their whole family Right. Mm -hmm. And it was just because of, um, you know, your actions, man. I mean, and this is a, every business. I think I, I can't stand the phrase is just business. It's not personal. I think everything's personal, right? How you do business is how you're going to, how you're going to act personally. If you're going to, if you're going to, for lack of a better term, screw somebody over on the business side, you're going to do that on the personal side too. I don't want anything to do with you. Right. And right. so I try to, I try to be that way to uh, the people that work with me. And I also try to convey that to my kids because they're always watching. That's right. And how many kids do you have? You said you had a few, a few girls, right? I'm knee deep, man. I got three small ones, three girls. So 11, nine and six. And uh, we're, we're having the time of our life right now. Truthfully, I mean, I'm older, so I'm 53 years old. So I'm an older dad. Uh, so I got to keep up with them. But man, it's so much fun. That's awesome. I got two yeah. girls and I'm a little bit of an older dad, too. And whew, they worry <laughs> out. But I feel like at least I've got more patience. Do you, do you think that about yourself? I don't know, bro. I mean, I think I think so. I think that if I would have had them in my 20s, I would have probably messed them up. 
So there's no doubt about that because I was a mess up, right? Uh, I didn't know who I was at that time. I was trying to figure that out and bringing another human being and soul into, into that. Uh, it probably would not have gone well. So I think so. I think I, I become a better dad just like in anything else with every child, right? Like I've gone, uh, my second child, I'm like, oh, I've gone through this already. I, I, know, what, I know what to do, right? That first yeah. one, you're kind of, it was a little bit tough. But just like in anything else, I mean, just you keep doing it, you keep getting better at it, hopefully. Yeah, same here, same here. Yeah. So, so Mike, what, what are you working on now these days? What's got you excited? What do you get out of bed to just jump up and do? Yeah, man, I mean, so there's a lot of things. I mean, uh, right now, obviously, you know, Skip Force, we are, you know, we're, we've always been priced really, really well. And so right now with, with what's going on in the economy and the recession, I think that we fit our, our, our value proposition to our clients are, is tremendous, right? And so one of the things that I get super excited about is I love talking to other investors and talking to them about, you know, their business. And, and right now there's a lot of people just kind of dropping out. They're just kind of going off the sidelines, holding their cash or, or throttling back on their marketing, which truthfully is the worst thing you could possibly do. You know what I mean? I understand you got to keep things in budget and stuff like that, but you got to get, you got to be a little bit smarter because this next year is going to be a, an amazing opportunity. So a lot of times whenever people, you know, because with our uh, customer success team, when people are, are canceling our membership or whatever, we haven't heard from them in a while, you know, we want to get on the phone with them, see what's going on. And nine times out of 10, it is something within their own process. It's like, you know, they're not training their, you know, we call them ISAs, inside sales agents, but it's really just cold callers or VAs uh, or anybody that's even taken in a lead if it's if it's an inbound lead. They're just not training them well enough. They're putting them in a script, put, putting very little time into them and uh, and kind of hoping for the best, right? Because one, they don't have the patience, the skill or the time. It's going to be one of those three. And so we could always dive in. I could always pretty much put my finger on it. So we created this new um, uh, company and we just, we're literally just launching. It's called ISA Pros, where we're literally taking our systems and processes and we're, we're transitioning it and training our clients, prospectors and lead managers. Because anytime that you outsource that, especially on the prospecting side of cold calling, you, if you outsource it to a cold calling company, you lose a lot of control. Right. And especially what's going on right now with the carriers and stuff like that. You want to control of the dollar. You want control of the education. Uh, so we provide the education. They still work for them and then we give them better results. And so that's super exciting. That's super fun for uh, for us because my team is super into it. Like they like we geek out in sales. When I said that I was a uh, I was a artist. You know, before it used to be a different medium. Obviously, it was hair, right? I was creating something there. Now it's in sales and words and teaching people from another country. Like one of my VAs is RAM, and they close deals from Colombia and from the Philippines, right? And it's just because we taught them. You know, we taught them how to do it, and they get super stoked and excited about it. And so what we like now, now we're having them teach, you know, uh, these other VAs. And I love that feeling when these people come in and they're like, I've been a VA for six years. I've been a, you know, I've been doing this forever. Um, and then we teach them like, Hey, you know, you, you get that light bulb going. I haven't really seen, I haven't seen it like this, or this hasn't been presented to me like this. And I, I love those little light bulb moments, you know? So super excited about that. That's, that's a lot of fun. That's something that we're excited to, that we think would bring a lot of value. That's awesome. And can we go to ISA, isapros.com right now and, and get signed up for a beta or anything? Or wait list? Yeah, man. I mean, it just like literally when I say launch, it literally just launched last week, right? So you could definitely go on there. What it does is that you have to sign up for a foundations course. Our foundations course is the second Monday of every single month. It's a three-day foundations course. They're in there for three hours for three days. Uh, that's going to set that foundation from, and then they transition into a group. We call it the iron agent drilling group where they will literally go the first phase one will they'll, they'll sit there and, and go over the basics to make sure that it's second nature because the worst thing you could do when it comes to, you know, uh, uh, prospectors or, or even inbound prospectors is have them script oriented. So we want them to be super fluid. Uh, you know, active listening. And, and if, I'm sure you're an investor, right? So you sure, I'm sure you get cold calls. Do you ever go through that sales cycle with them? It's, it's horrendous. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, it's so cringy that you're like, oh, so it takes some time. The reason why it takes some time. So we do that phase one, the six weeks thing. And then phase two is continuous 
you know, upper uh, uh, type of education and they get to drill, you know, uh, unlimited amount for a month uh, with our with our agents from 12 to one. So it, it, it serves a purpose. And I like that. That's really cool that you guys are training, like not just script reading robots, right? Like you guys are teaching them how to, you know, be nimble and be on their feet because they're going to have much better conversations that way, right? That is 100%, man, because you know what? It, it, you have to separate yourself from everybody else. Everybody's getting bombarded with phone calls, being sold to constantly, right? And if you're going to sound just like everybody, it's amazing how they still use some of the scripts that they've used for years. Like they worked five years ago, right? The whole out of the blue thing or whatever the case, right? I'm calling you out of the blue. And all, you know, to the prospect, that triggers, this is a sales call. My defense, my guard is up right mm -hmm. off the bat. You know what I mean? And, uh, and we just teach them something totally different. Like it's, uh, you got to talk to the person as if you're talking to your neighbor and you have to have the confidence to be able to do it. So it's not, is we always say this, like you're an actor and the script is only there as a guide. You just have to understand every component of the script because you got to go through them, but it's really dictated by the prospect and how they want that conversation to be led. So it's unbelievably, um, it's unbelievably difficult to do if you don't put the time and effort into it yourself to train them. Yeah. And that's tough. I mean, if you're growing a team like that, it's tough to keep up on training. So is this just for investors with, uh, you know, ISAs working under them or can, you know, if I'm, if I want to learn more about how to sell and how to cold call, uh, can I sign up just as an individual? Yeah, man. I yeah. mean, we have people that are active investors that, you know, that are cold calling. We've actually had people that are, they cold call for their own business. And so they thought there would be a refresher course and then they got value out of it. That's where I was like super stoked, right? That's when I'm like, okay, we have something that could really bring value to the marketplace. Because if I have experienced guys coming in going, you know, I got, I got something um um that, that's important and i and i always seek that i mean i heard I, I i read this book not long ago go for the no i don't know if you ever read that or not uh and it's a super short book it's an audio book it's like an hour and a half right and the premise of it is always like you gotta seek failure like seek it almost as quickly as possible you know what i mean so i always want to know about my product as quick as it, it pains me to have a bad product like, I don't want to, I don't want to sell bad stuff. You know what I mean? It's like, it pains me. So uh, whenever, you know, we were launching that and we had people in there, they were actually experienced investors. And I'm like, you know, ah, how was it? <laughs> and they're like, dude, that was great. I, I was like, oh my God. All right. Thank you. You know, awesome. You know, and you know, we're going to evolve uh, along the way uh, like everything else. But the fact that it brought value, that's awesome, man. That's really cool. I might have to sign up for that because I could definitely use some help. I definitely uh, have dropped the out of the blue line once or twice. <laughs> I mean, I think that we all get in a rut, right? You know, I mean, we all just kind of get in a rut and, and do the same things over and over. But I think just like in anything else in business, it, you have to evolve. You have to stand out somehow. You know, and especially in that medium, because that medium is a tough medium because the carriers have changed a lot of, uh, of, of, um, you know, barriers that have implemented a lot of barriers to be able to have that connection with somebody. Right. So when you do have that connection, you got to maximize it. It's totally true. So guys, if you want to learn more about Mike's company, skip force for your skip tracing and data needs, you guys can go to reiclub.com slash skip force. And we'll also post a link there to the ISA pros, uh, class. What'd you call the class, Mike? It's Rockstar Foundations class. So that's that's the first Foundations three day class, and after that is the Iron Agent Drilling Club. So IAD. Awesome. All right. Well, let's get signed up for that Foundations class too. I we'll have a link in that and in the show notes, guys. So Mike, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show and tell us about your first and worst deal. Uh, I think we learned a lot from you today. <laughs> Thanks, man. I learned a lot. <laughs> Good, man. Well, I hope you just le learned at least how like other people can see your situation and, you know, how you value your integrity and your reputation. Well, I just think that there's a lot. I mean, if you see, you know, if you see people that are always crushing in this business, there's that that's not true. There's a lot of ups and downs, <laughs> just like in life. Right. Right. Cool, guys. Well, thanks so much, guys, for coming. Uh, Mike, thanks for being a guest and talk to you guys all later. This is George Uno with REI Club. See you guys on the next episode of First and Worst. Bye, guys.